turn your hymnal to page 348. 134, 134, 134.
Amen to that. Amen. Let's turn to page 469. 469. I will serve thee. How great thou art. Everybody wants to stand up and we'll sing that. Um, that is on page. Hold on one second. Let me get that for you. Um, it is 33 in your hymnal. Page 33.
Sirius Radio 65, they have enlightened, and on Sunday mornings, it's the old gospel songs. They sang, the trumpet sang, How Great Thou Art this morning, and, and I sang all the way from Clinton to Allen Creek this morning, and my voice is sketchy, it's rough, it's tough, it's like I got a sore throat, but I'm praising God all day long. He is so good. He is so good. I'm going to talk tonight, we'll have prayer in a bit, but I'm going to talk tonight about revival. And this kind of sore throat, and I was trying to make excuses for it. And I sang all the way down to Clinton and then up here. And then I put it back over, and I sang all the way back. And see, I can sing in the car. Oh, I can't sing any other time because my voice is just terrible. But I want to tell you what, I was praising God today while I was in my heart. One of the things every single minute that I had to do today. And I thank you. Been talking about revival, revival fires. I want I want to spend some time on this tonight. Father, we love you. And God, we lift you up. God, we thank you for the music. God, we thank you for singing that song, How Great Thou Art. And God, tonight we're going to proclaim your goodness and your grace and your mercy and your love. God, you've been so good to us. So God, tonight we ask that you'll always be with us. We ask that the things that we say things that we think would bring glory and honor to you. Nothing ain't for us, but everything for the praise of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to try not to get too excited. Um, Cindy is down at uh, West Side, but Wednesday night I was over at First Church, and we come back, and, and I thought I had a good lesson, and, and it was good. But she said, I talk with my hands more than anybody in the whole world, and I thought she did. So I'm going to work on that tonight. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. So just bear with me. But today, we hear a lot about revival. And when we, we took a church, and I went, and, and after a year or so, the people clamored they wanted revival. They wanted revival. So we scheduled a meeting. We had a revival. And, and, and the church didn't come out real good for it. And the thing I realized from that is that we have to want revival in our hearts Somebody go ahead and say amen because you know what's coming. Say amen. I'm not going to hurt you. We have to want revival in our heart for there to be revival. We have to be willing to accept, accept the things that need changed in us first. Somebody says, we're Nazarenes. We don't need to change anything. You're lying. 
I'm lying if I say that. So we're going to talk about this tonight. I think, number one, we need to pray for revival. I think that's always in tune with God's will. We pray for revival. But when we pray for something, what do we really want? Too many times, I think, that we think it's a meeting. And, and you know, it used to be it was sometime to sometime, Sunday to Saturday, I don't know. And then if the Holy Spirit was real good, it would go another week or another two weeks. And, and you measured how many people were saved and how many people came. I'm not sure that's what revival is. Revival is when the church gets on fire for the Lord. Inside or outside the church, in the cars, at home, wherever you are, as we get on fire for the Lord, then there's revival. And God can work with us until my heart is melted and your heart is melted. There's not going to be a revival. Sometimes that melting comes during the revival. Somebody say amen. God's people need revival. I need revival. America, we've heard this preached all over, America needs revival. And, and Veterans Day is this week, and I spent a lot of time on that this morning. But I believe included with this statement, we need a good, old-fashioned, Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, down-to-earth, stop and revival. Get rid of those big, fancy words, those preachers that have ties on Sunday night. Did you catch it? Get rid of all those big words. We need to reduce it to where we understand what it is we want and what we're talking about, and that is for the Holy Spirit to come in and fill us and fill the church. And, and I like to think that, that when people would drive by Elk River Church of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit would burn them out there on the main road. Somebody say amen. You say, Pastor, that's crazy. No, it's not. Remember what happened this past year. But why not revival? I believe that before Christ returns, in my opinion, there's going to be a great revival. I believe that with every ounce. I mean, Bill, we talked about it. And I really believe that. And in my, that's my opinion. The church and the people are comfortable. Anybody going to say a word? We're too comfortable, church. We, 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 we sit back and we sing the same old song. Half the time, and I'm guilty, I sit by myself a lot so I can sing out loud. But, but we, we need to sing praises to God. We need to lift up his name. I don't want to be a pew holder, seat holder, whatever you call them. I want to be a participant. And as we're participants with the Holy Spirit, great things will happen. We, we, we need and we want and, and we need revival. But are we really, really wanting and waiting? Some things I talk about, we, and what is a revival? I looked up several definitions, and, and you, you can come up with all kinds of them, but the first part I wrote down is an improvement in the condition or strength of something. Churches need improved. I'm not knocking our church. I'm knocking the church across the land. We've lost our strength, our attitude, our zeal, our pizzazz, whatever you want to call it, for the Lord. It's a drudgery. Some people get up on Sunday morning. Matter of fact, some people don't even get up. That was free. Did you catch that and all? I don't preach on attendance because the people that hear don't need to hear it and everything. And two, an instance of something, something becoming, becoming popular, popular, active, or important. important. Again, church needs to be important to people. Now, now with church comes God. I'm not trying to say the church saves you. Somebody get that somewhere off their minds and everything. But church becomes important to us. I love being in church. The biblical definition for revival by a guy named Robert Coleman, the awakening or quickening of God's people to their true nature and purpose. Sanctified believers, born again believers, that's our true nature. We're serving a living God. Our God's alive. I love football. Anybody like football besides me? Bill, put up your hand. I got you. Anybody else? I like football. And I get all excited, and I, I can, sometimes I sit up on the edge of my seat. That hurts my back, but I still sit there. And sometimes when West Virginia does bad, go, oh, anybody else like that or somebody does bad? We need to be more excited for Christ than we do a football game. That was free, too. We talk of re, and revival, seeing people saved, but, but that's not just all that's in the confines of the definition. We, a revival with Mark of being on fire for the Lord. Right? The church must return to the roots, to its original roots, and those roots are Jesus Christ first. 
The other stuff don't count. It's important. We need other stuff to draw people in. We need this and that. But without Jesus Christ, a church is not a church. I'm getting a couple of people saying that's right and everything. When the, when the people, when the church people, and again, I'm not talking just to Elk River. I'm talking to churches across the land. Once change and sacrifice, there'll be a revival. It will not come from lip service. I can get here and preach every night. Bill can preach every other night. Patrick can preach every Sunday morning. We can do all this, and just lip service is not going to bring a revival. It's time that churches quit giving just lip service. That's an amen place. To understand revival, that song, How Great Thou Art, to understand revival, we have to understand that Jesus' return is imminent. If we could just get that really fixed, I got a thick head. Anybody else have a thick head? You don't want to answer that. I see that hand. I, I said, Bill, Rosa, I see him pointing. I have a thick head. Matter of fact, when I was born, I, I, it was kind of bad, and I had to use some forceps and pull me up because my head was so thick. It, things wasn't just working right and everything. I got a thick head. You got to drive it into me, into me with a hammer. But Jesus' return is imminent. The, the deal is, though, what's imminent to him is not necessarily imminent to me. He doesn't measure time like you and I measure time. We, we say it could be today, and it could be today. That's God's business. I want to read some scripture here just for a second, and this is some Paul's teaching, and it's about Christ's return. And what had happened in the church at Thessalonica, the old Judaism way had begun to, to ease its way back in. And they began to church, teach the church back in the old ways that they believed that if Christ came, I'm sorry, if they died before Christ come, that they would not be saved. Now, that's not what the scriptures say. That's what, not what Christ taught. So listen to this first. It says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, those that are dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And I want you to think about the Lord himself. He's not going to send a proxy. He's not going to send anybody else. It's going to be Jesus himself as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall be ever with the Lord. Verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I think that verse 18 is the most important of all. Comfort one another with these words. Our hope is on Jesus' return. If he weren't alive in heaven interceding for you and I, and if he weren't going to come back, he'd be like all the other gods. He'd be dead. God's alive, church, and we need to be alive with him. Comfort to one another is understanding and part of revival. Christ has not yet returned. But he will. The Bible tells us that. And ask a question, can God lie? Can God lie? At least nod your heads no. If you don't want to say no, nod your heads no. God can't lie, can he? Come on, God can't lie, can he? And, and, but sometimes we want to act like he can. And, everything, and he tells us that he'll come back. And he, God, will determine the day and the hour. It's not even the angels, not even Jesus knows when they return. God himself is long-suffering. And he will send Jesus. He'll say, son, go get my church when it's God's time. The signs are right. Until then, we've got to do two things, I think. And there's, there's more to add to it. You grow in the word. It's our responsibility to grow in the word. I've had people say to me, <coughs> Pastor, I just don't get anything out of being in church. Not the church's fault. Not the pastor's fault. We need to get in the Bible ourselves. Somebody said that's right. Who was that? Thank you, Steve. We got to get in the Bible. Ourselves. You can't just depend on Randy Levson. He don't know everything about the Bible. Neither do I. Come on. He's good. But if we want to understand, if we want God to speak to us, we've got to open up the Bible and read our cell phone. I've had people say, well, you can't use, do I have mine? You can't use your cell phone. Why not? I like King James when I'm preaching. He's got King James on there. Doesn't it? Don't tell people how to read it. Just tell them to read it and all. And then two, we've got to win others. As we begin to win others, revival will come. I've got, I know this, you'll find this hard to believe. I've got a couple of pretty good friends. 
Who's laughing? That, that hurt me. And, and when I'm with those friends, and they're, they're men, I won't call name line, but Bill's one of them. Both Bills are one of them, quite honestly. We, we often talk about Christ's return. I'm pretty excited about the fact that Jesus will return. Aren't you? I'm excited about that. I want my kids to be excited about it. And, and as we know, that return is near. Satan knows it's near to. Satan's not a dummy. And I don't give him any credit. But he's not a dummy. Come on. Is he? He's not a dummy. You know, the problem is he's so consumed in himself, he doesn't believe he's going to return. Satan believes he's going to win. He's not reading the same book I'm reading. He's not going to win. Amen? He's not going to win. We're in a great battle today, and, and Satan, I believe, is making his final stand. If we look at what's going on in Israel, and, and Israel's God's favorite nation, if we look at what's going on in America, how people are attacking our core beliefs, we have to understand that Satan's on the war path. Now, in case some of you aren't as old as me, the war path is like when I used to watch Roy Rogers and all those people. Anybody else watch Roy Rogers? And they'd have those wagon trains, and the Indians would circle the wagon train. They'd be on the war path. Satan's on the warpath. He's doing everything he can to attack us whenever and however he can. The Bible talks about Antichrist. There are many Antichrists, but there's only one that will possess the charm, the deceit, the, the looks good, the appearance that has all the answers. He is the Antichrist. And there are people in the world today that are Antichrist, and the church needs to understand that everybody that walks is not for Jesus Christ. Satan's like a lion seeking whom he can devour. He'd like nothing better than one of us to backslide because he feels like he's getting ahead on the church. I pray for my kids. He'd like nothing better than my kids not to be saved because he knows that gnaws at me. You pray for your kids or your family? Sure you do. Pray for Cain? Sure you do. We want, we want our family to be okay in every way. I'm going to tell you what, I'm ready to go. Now, I've got to tell you this, I'm enjoying living. Anybody else enjoying living? It will make you smile and grin. I enjoy living. I enjoy the popcorn. I enjoy the potato chips. Sometimes I even enjoy my wife fussing at me. Not often, but, sometimes, but I enjoy living. Living's good, isn't it? And it's good to see our friends and our family. But if Jesus would, would come today, I'd be happy. I'd be sad because my, my kids aren't saved. But I know, I know my sins are forgiven, and I know how I shall spend eternity. How about you? But if we have revival, it goes so much further than that, Kim. We want to tell the world. We want to tell everybody we see, everybody we come in contact. I don't mean take them over the, the, the hat and the head with a hammer and beat them. That's not what I'm talking about. People need to see Jesus living in us. That's how we're going to convince them. I can stand here and preach all day, but if I go out here and live like an idiot the rest of my life, I'm not going to do much good, am I? No, 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 it's okay. Ready for Jesus' return. My kids aren't ready. My family is not ready. Oh, that, that bothers me so. I want a revival so that somehow the Holy Ghost will just get a hold of them, twist their innards upside down them except Jesus. And I know you want the same for your own. You say, well, Mike, what's all this have to do with revival? Jesus is going to come. You and I got to be ready. But the rest of the world needs to be ready too. And it's our job. It's our job to tell people about Jesus. It's about the, the word and about the things that go on. If you, I watch the news way too much. I know nobody else watches the news. I'll come to that in a minute. It's not just America that's in trouble. The world's in trouble. We often think because we live in America, and I love this land, I'm a patriot to the nth degree, but the world's in trouble. We're pushing, we're pushing Christ away. We're letting Muslim come in and all these other things that are anti-Christ. And that's wrong. Scripture tells us there's only one door, only one way to enter heaven's doors. You know what Scripture says? How many doors did the ark have in it that we know about? One door. One way in. The only way that's going to make it through is in that. Only those that were in accord with God went in. 
Only those of us that are in accord with God will enter. Amen? So I says, Mike, that's negative preaching. We need to get negative sometimes so we can let people know just how serious this thing really is. I care about my kids. I care about your kids. I care about you. I want to read some scripture, if I might. It's, and I'd ask you to turn with Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. You've heard it many times. I may have used it here one other night. Matthew chapter 25. Some scholars would say this is aimed more towards Israel. I think it's an individual thing. It says, then shall the kingdom, I'm sorry, is everybody ready? Okay. Matthew 25. Okay. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened to the ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Got it? Ten. Ten women waiting on the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. In other words, five did what was good and five didn't, as we'll find out. They that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. You see, they took their lamp, knowing they would need it in the darkness. But that lamp takes oil, it takes fuel to burn. But they didn't take, they didn't take the fuel with them. The wise took in their vessels, took oil in their vessels with their lamps. See, with their lamps, they took oil so that when they lit them, it would lighten up. When the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and they slept. I'm afraid while Jesus is tarrying, too many of us are slumbering and sleeping. And at midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out and meet him. All oh, the excitement, the, the anticipation. Oh, Then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. If you know what a lamp is, if you ever had oil lamps, you've got to raise that wick up and get it just right and keep it trimmed off just right and keep the old soot off of it, the burnt part off of it and all. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are going out. They didn't have light to see. Now, but the wise answer is saying, not so, not so. Lest there not be enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. As what came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, pay attention, verily I say unto you, I know you not. We need to be ready today. We need to be ready this minute. We need to tell others about Jesus so they, they, can, they can be ready. One way in, one door, that way is through Jesus. Jesus tells us in the, in the New Living Translation, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the only way, the only truth and the life. Some of you are, are really good friends and you'd stand with me. And you say, you'd vouch for me before God. Your vouching for me doesn't do any good. My accepting the blood of Jesus and my staying true to God is what will get me into the kingdom. Nothing else, nothing short of that. You can't buy your way in. No one can come to the Father, John 14, 6, except through me. Not, he is not a way, but he is the way. Not a way, he is the way. Blood of Jesus is the only way to eternal life. It's time for, for Christ's return to draw near. Satan's on a rampage. We want to fix everything ourselves or we want to blame somebody else. I'm a fixer. Many of you are fixers. I've been with you. There, there's some, some things that, that I want to point. Jesus is the only answer. We want revival. Jesus is the answer. The Holy Ghost is the answer. But some things, we, people put their faith in, in Trump. Trump's not going to save us. Then some people, oh, so I can get both sides. Some people put their trust in Biden. Biden's not going to save us, is he? They're not going to save us. Not Putin, Putin, whatever his name is. Not Joel Osteen. That was a joke. All right. Not the church building. You can come to this building all you want to, and it's not going to save you. Not going to save me. It's a great building. It's beautiful, isn't it? 
Isn't it beautiful? Look around. Isn't it beautiful? I love coming here. But guess what? I can come here every day the rest of my life, and it's not going to save me. Or you. No, Elon Musk. Not justice or baby dog. They can't save you. Can they? Not money. Not drugs. Not prestige. Not even a COVID shot can save you. Only the blood of Jesus can save us. We need to get back to teaching the world that it's Jesus first and only. I want revival. I said we got to quit talking to have revival. It begins with us. It begins with you and I. We need to have a mind change and a heart change. We need to, to lay our all before the altar. God, help me, help, to, help me to understand what I need to do. Lord, we want revival and just, just lay it all out to him. The building doesn't do it. Believers must live a holy life. You hear people talking about holiness much anymore. We need to give God our all, our will, and we must accept, ask and accept sanctification. That's another sermon. We got to embrace Jesus with our all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see our daughter two or three or four days after Thanksgiving. And when I see her, I'm going to hug her up real big because it's been since last March or April since I've seen her. I'm going to hug her the best I can. I'm going to give her my all. That ain't going to save her. Is it? I'm going to find time to tell her about Jesus again. We've got we to gotta plan and do things properly, not just by haphazard. We want to have revival. Believers got to want to change and bring it into their heart. A change that's revealed and brought by the Holy Spirit. I've had people tell me, because I'm, I'm very comfortable with the word Holy Ghost, and I've had people say, well, well, pastor, we don't like that word Holy Ghost. That's old timey. Huh, they got a problem. No, if I said, I don't have a problem about it. I have a lot of problems, but that's not a problem. You with me? I was doing a funeral one time. I shared this with you on Sunday night. And, and they wanted programs for the funeral, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. And I put on their brother so-and-so and this one younger son who was kind of high flute and, you know, had his, I don't even know if I've ever buttoned my, I can still get it buttoned. Had his coat buttoned, had his tie on. He says, Pastor, I don't want you to put that word brother in the program. I said, why not? He's my brother. He's not your brother. Yeah, yeah, you see, the world can't understand what we're talking about. I want some new brothers and some new sisters, amen? And that comes by people being saved. Not enough just to know there's a God, but we've got to embrace him. We've got to accept his son and walk in his light. We need to tell others about Jesus. It's important that we tell others. If we, the church, doesn't put this message out, when Christ comes, you'll be lost. Breaks my heart for my kids, for my grandkids, for my family, for your family, for those that don't know Jesus. I come in contact with people every day. Some won't even talk to me about Jesus. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But it doesn't say we quit. It says we pray for them, and we ask the Holy Spirit to give us opportunity. And then again, it's not just America that we worry about. Some of our church families going on a mission trip, and those mission trips are so important, and we need to lift them up. And even now, we need to begin to pray for them that they're there, and not just for their safety, but they would reach and tell others about Jesus, that they would accept Jesus as their Savior. It's great to go on a mission trip, and it's great to help people, and we ought to. The Word says we love our neighbors as ourselves. They're our neighbors. Nod your heads. Nod your Some of you don't believe they're our neighbors. Do I need to start all over again tonight? I don't want to say all this over again. I don't think I could. But we need to pray for the, for the Holy Spirit to be with those guys and those gals and all. It's more important today than yesterday. The Bible tells us about, about the signs. It talks about wars and rumors of war. And, and we, we've seen all this stuff with Ukraine. You, well, I'm talking too fast, aren't I? With Ukraine, we've seen all this stuff with Israel. We see, and, and now they're saying, well, who else in the East is going to join? What's Lebanon going to do? Who's Russia going to side with? Who's China going to side with? I'm here to tell you those communist nations are enemies of us. Talk about famine. Let me share with you. The Chinese have bought significant portions of our farmland out west. And you have to know that they're not going to grow corn and give it to us. And you have to know that corn is used in a major part of what we eat. 
scary. How about the drought out west and the, the droughts down in Florida? The Bible talks about a great falling away, and we don't have to look very far. We, we've, seen, we've seen fallings away, and falling away is not just of the numbers, but it's away from the preaching of God's word. People want to tickle ears anymore. I'd rather you be saved than me tickle your ear. I'd rather you be saved than you like me. Amen? And we, we, we need to get that in all. But there's been a great falling away from religion and, and the things of religion, and, and we often talk about those signs. I'm not going to do it. How about earthquakes and turmoil? There's an earthquake in California that then at the same time as one in another country. Several people were killed. Earthquakes everywhere you look. See, the, the world's churning, but God's not still not ready. Only one answer. That answer is Jesus. I want revival. Not for me. We were at the Blue Creek Church and just been saved. Preacher Coleman said, we're going to have it. This is like in November. I don't know when he said it. We'll have a revival in May the something. We had a 100-acre farm. 22 cows that Cindy's dad and I owned. We planted about two acres. We froze and canned and all that kind of stuff. And here this preacher scheduled revival at planting time. I wasn't happy with him. I went to him. Never had good sense. I said, preacher, several people here planting garden, but I planted a big garden. And said, I just don't know if I can make it. And he talked and we talked back and forth. said, just Mike. Do whatever the Holy Spirit guides you. Now that's telling me, Holy Spirit's telling you to go. When a preacher tells you that, that's what they're telling you, you know it. Nod your heads. That's what they're really saying. So, and, and two or three times I went back, just fussing and all, and it came to revival time. We had a guy named Gordon Noble come up, great preacher. It comes Sunday night of revival, and the forecast for that week was for nothing but a beautiful week. And we, were, we had a full-time job, and we had to rush home and get stuff planted. And all week long, all week long, we could have planted gardens. And I looked, and every day, I said, I don't know if I'm going to go to church tonight. I need to plant that garden. Every night I went to church. I didn't know any better. Say, I thought you were supposed to go to church. That's an amen place. That's an amen place. That's an amen place, church. I thought you were supposed to go to church. It was pretty Monday night and Tuesday night and Wednesday night. It got prettier Thursday and Friday and Saturday. I'm saying, God, now, you know, I'm a young Christian. I'm saying, God, how can you do this to me? You ever ask God that? How can you do this to me, God? Revival's over. Good revival. Come back. Monday, it rained. And it rained Tuesday. And it rained Wednesday. And, you know, you can't plant the day after it rains because the ground gets wet and it's muddy and, and you, can't, you can't get it up and everything. And I'm still fussed. I went back to, to Jimmy Coleman. I said, Preacher, I said, I can't believe y'all did me like this. You and God got something against me. That wasn't God. They didn't have anything against me. Well, we finally got to plant like a week later, and we had the best garden we have ever had, the whole gardens that we planted. You see, you can't outdo God. You can't outdo God. Get that? Nod your heads. You can't outdo God. I think I can sometimes, but you can't outdo, outdo God. Last day, it says the word will be preached throughout the world. We know that the word has been preached. I want America back. That's not selfish for Mike Todorovich. I want us to be a God-loving, God-fearing nation. I love America. Please don't misunderstand. I lift America. The, I wouldn't live any place else here. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely fantastic with this country. Amen? But we're slowly losing it to the dark side. We need revival in our great, in our great land. I want the world back. We've got to reach out to Christ and follow after him. Listen to what the scripture says. Do not say Four months or more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. The fields cannot be any riper than they are today. People need Jesus. They just don't know it. We've got to show them that they need Jesus. 
So why do I want revival? Why is this important? One, we're kind of possessed about it on Tuesday mornings a bit, which is a good thing to be possessed about things of God. But I want America back for my kids and my grandkids. There, I got a new great-grandchild, best-looking young man you've ever seen in your life, four months old. If any of you have grandkids or whatever, they don't look as good as him. Get it? I want him to have a better world, not as far as goods, not as far as cars, not as far as the stuff to eat, but we have a better world where people truly love one another, where that Jesus Christ is first, where people are preaching the gospel, where the altars are filled, where we're telling people about Jesus. I love Jesus with all my heart, with all my mind, with everything that I am. I want revival for our church and for our land. Father, we do love you. And God, I, I don't use real pretty words. God, I don't even time together so well. But God, I've got a passion for you. I've got a deep love for you. And God, our church has a love. It has a passion. But God, we want... We want that passion, that love to go outside outside our doors. Like we say, Lord, we, we truly pray that the Holy Spirit would be so strong in this place that people could feel your awesome power as they walk by or drive by this place. And God, I believe that starts with revival with us. So God, I pray that, that our minds would be opened, our hearts changed, be, we'd be willing to do what it takes for us to be right for revival so we can expect revival for the world. So God, we leave tonight, Lord, just, just telling you that we love you, asking that, that our minds be clear, that we serve you, and we ask for revival in this great land. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you.